Thank you all. We are here this morning under, I think, some uncomfortable circumstances. We rewind three days ago, and what happened, I think, in this country is changed the way even I look at our own future. And I do want to start with a reflection on the fact that the Democrat-led media, they called him a tyrant. They called him a despot. They called him a dictator, said it would be the end of the United States of America as we know it, and that we would be the laughing stock of the global stage. And it was shortly after that that an assassin shot the president with a bullet. In this case, I'm not talking about Donald Trump, actually. I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican president. This was back in 1865. He was the person who at this convention, the Republican convention, about 160 plus years ago warned that a house divided cannot stand on the, nation, on the brink of a civil war for our country. The truth is I think we were a hair's breadth away from a civil war just a few nights ago. And the difficult part about it is we are in the middle of a kind of war in this country, but our enemy is not the Democrats. Our enemy is an ideology, and our task ahead is how do we defeat that poisonous ideology while still viewing our fellow citizens as our citizens, our neighbors who deserve to be liberated from that ideology. We're not going to win this election, and we're not going to revive this country, I believe, by just lambasting the other side. We're going to win this country back by reviving who we are and what we actually stand for, by answering what does it mean to be a Republican in the year 2024? What does it mean to be an American in the year 2024? And to me, it means we believe in the ideals of 1776, the ideals that our founding fathers set into motion 250 years ago, irrespective of what the other side puts up today. We're not going to be reactionaries defining ourselves in response to what the other side puts up. We're going to define ourselves based on the ideals this country was founded on. Ideals like free speech, that you get to speak your mind openly as long as I get to in return. Ideals like merit, that you do get ahead in this country not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. That we, the people, create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. That the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government. Not a shadow government sitting in the deep state that runs the show today. See, those are not black ideas or white ideas. They're not Democrat ideas or Republican ideas. They're American ideals that we fought a revolution in this country to secure 250 years ago. And I believe those ideals still exist. It is going to be our job to actually revive them. We're here talking about the future direction of policy in this country. It's one of the reasons I appreciate the work of the Heritage Foundation and the people who have done the hard work of laying out the vision for regardless of who's going to sit in the seat, what's the policy vision we're actually going to drive forward. And if you ask me, there's a lot of policy agenda items that matter to the future of the country. Sure, we can rank order them. But the top of the list, and if we're being honest, I think this is a bit of a fork in the road, even in our own party, even in our own conservative movement, among friends and allies. But we have to acknowledge the rift nonetheless. We're going to be at our best if we actually acknowledge what our priorities are. Is our priority to co-opt and use the administrative state and the nanny state to accomplish our own ends? Or is our goal actually to dismantle the nanny state and the regulatory state altogether? That's the fork in the road ahead for our movement. And I believe that we're not going to solve this through incrementalism. We're not going to solve this through reforming the administrative state, through reshaping and redirecting it. No. I think the only right answer left is for that fourth branch of government, for that shadow government that's really pulling the strings today, the only answer that remains is we have to be willing to get in there and actually shut it down. That is how we revive the United States of America. We don't want to replace a left-wing nanny state with a right-wing nanny state. We want to dismantle that nanny state altogether. And it's worth understanding that this is not some technical issue, right? Right now, most of the rules that bind people in this country, they're not even written by Congress. 
They're never passed by the Senate. They're never signed into law by the president. They're written by unelected bureaucrats in the back of three-letter government agency buildings who were never elected to their positions with no backstop of democratic accountability that actually create most of the laws in this country. Thanks to the Supreme Court and thanks to the justices that Donald Trump put on the Supreme Court, we have a historic opportunity. I think this is a once-in-a-century opportunity. I think it's a once-in-a-generation opportunity. It may be the last opportunity that we are given in this country to finally use the overturning of the Chevron Doctrine in the recent Loper case. Two years ago, West Virginia versus EPA, SEC versus Jarksky, that has laid the groundwork, planted the seeds for dismantling that administrative state. What we need is a president armed with a policy agenda to go in there and actually get the job done. And if we do, that's a modern revival of 1776 itself, a modern declaration of independence that we first fought 250 years ago. The thing to understand about the administrative state is that we sometimes fall into the trap of talking about it like the people who are the bureaucrats are actually out to deprive us of our rights because they despise us. I actually think that misses the point. If you really want to understand that deep state, it is not their malevolence towards us, but their perceived benevolence towards us. This is actually the vision of old world Europe. Old world Europe b believed that we the people could not be trusted to self-govern. That we the people couldn't be trusted to vote at the ballot box to decide how we're going to take on climate change or racial injustice or whatever. No. The old world vision was that it had to be a group of enlightened elites in the back of palace halls, today in the back of three-letter government agency buildings that did that instead. And our vision at our founding was to say hell no to that vision. That we the people, for better or worse, we the people would actually decide our differences at the ballot box through free speech and open debate. That's the American way. This is not a left-wing idea or a right-wing idea, but the idea that we the people create a government that is accountable to us, that the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government. That's how we revive our constitutional republic. That's why our founding fathers fought a revolution 250 years ago. That is what reunited this country after the Civil War and what won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is the vision that still gives hope to the rest of the free world. And if we can revive that dream over group identity and victimhood and grievance, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus, not China, not some shooter in Pennsylvania is going to dismantle us. That's what it means to be American, and that's what we're going to revive to save this great country. So thank you all for being here. God bless you and your families, and may God bless our great country. I'm going to call my friend Andy out here. We were actually going to have a bit of a conversation to, to close this out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivek. It's a pleasure to always have you, you. here at, uh, visiting us uh, at the Heritage Foundation. You were talking about the deep state. Yeah. Now, I grew up under Ronald Reagan, and he used to say that the nine scariest words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But I have another sentence for you. These might be the nine best words in the English language. I'm from Project 2025, and I'm here to win. <laughs> <laughs> So, I tell us a little bit more about how you actually go in and dismantle the deep state. So I think the biggest obstacle is actually ourselves looking ourselves in the mirror, our side looking ourselves in the mirror, and asking ourselves whether we're really willing to do what's required, to incur some of the short-term inconveniences to make that happen. If you're going in and really slashing 75% of the federal bureaucracy, moving agencies out of Washington, D.C., firing millions of federal bureaucrats, not just the mass deportation of millions of illegals from this country, which I do favor, but also, <laughs> don't forget, the mass deportation of millions of federal bureaucrats out of Washington, D.C., if we're really serious about that, it's going to involve some trade-offs. There will be some practical clunkiness to it. There will be some inconveniences. So we got to look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we actually willing to do it? I think there's a temptation from good people, people who I respect and love in our movement, 
who may say the right answer is to give the FTC a little bit more power to make sure they're looking after the antitrust mergers with uh, the antitrust review of mergers with a broader hand, or the CFPB to protect consumers more, or the Department of Transportation to make sure that our consumers and, and Americans are protected safe from planes falling from out of the sky or from trains going off the tracks. And these are good intentions that come from our own movement. But the hard part is when the rubber hits the road to say that even though that's tempting to do in the short run, how committed are we actually in the face of the other side telling us all of the short-term difficulties we're going to face, how committed are we actually to getting in there and dismantling it? And I think because of the work you've done here, you've built that conviction, you've laid out the plan. We have a historic opportunity both because of the Supreme Court and I believe the president who we're about to elect as the next leader of the free world to actually get in there and turn that vision into reality. That's what I'm rooting for, man. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for the compliments to our work. I want to talk about your work. We're, we're in this beautiful theater, and there's a great Shakespeare line that even in life, a soliloquy can become a grand performance. And Vivek, you have traveled the country. You've traveled the world. You are a spokesman for all of the right ideas and for America. That's a sacrifice. It's a testament to your commitment to all the things that have to happen across this country for change. But just tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about one of those experiences where you went into, you know, maybe not your home state of Ohio, but you're in another state and you were talking to your fellow Americans and you just felt inspired about what's going to happen and the change that's going to come to America. So I'll give you two examples from the campaign last year. I went to the south side of Chicago in the middle of the campaign. This is the middle of a Republican primary and my political advisors probably with a lot of good sense, said, you are wasting your time and money going to the south side of Chicago. And considering that I got a solid fourth in the Iowa caucus, they might have had a point. But, but I actually learned a lot from that trip. It was a room full of people, probably about as many people as in this room were in that room, 95% black. They told me it was 150% Democrat. Depends on how they count the votes these days in Chicago. But the, the reality was they were, you know, there was some tension in the room. I was a Republican candidate, not well known, the first question I got was a woman, she came up to the microphone and she said, what is your position on racial reparations to make sure that people like me and my family are compensated for the injustices committed to our ancestors? I answered honestly, I'm against racial reparations because I think they will be more divisive than helpful today and instead favor policies that lift up all Americans regardless of their skin color. She turned around midway through the response and she was walking out the door and there were a number of other people in the audience that sat up and actually stood up and actually started walking out the door as well. And the guy who invited me, he's a guy by the name of Tyrone, he, he actually also apparently was a vocal proponent of racial reparations, but he took the microphone and he said, hey, listen up, this man came here to our community in a way that no Republican and no Democrat has done in a very long time, I want you to sit yourselves down and to listen to what he has to say. So some of the people who were walking out came back and they sat down. Ten minutes later, we had a different question that came up. They were converting South Shore High School into an encampment for migrants at a cost of $7,000 per migrant per month, people who are in this country illegally. And people in the south side of Chicago were rightly asking, what the heck about me, who's following the rules and have a country that cares less about me than they do for people who broke the law and entered this country illegally? The next question I got was from somebody who said, how are we sending $200 billion to Ukraine when people right here in America and in this community are left suffering? And what I saw that came out of that, Andy, was that we left that room friends. I still stay in touch with many of the people who I met that day. Several of them actually have told me now they're going to come out and actually vote for Donald Trump this year, which is remarkable. But it tells me that the narrative of division is, I think, artificial, actually. I think that most of us in this country still do share the same basic values in common. The division, the narrative of division is a projection created by the media and created by those who benefit from that division. And the way we're going to unite this country is not, as sometimes we may be tempted to do, to compromise on our principles. That's not how we're going to unite the country. Show up at the 50-yard line, hold hands, sing kumbaya, and call it a day. No, that's not how we're going to unite the country. The way we're going to unite this country is by reviving those shared principles that unite all of us without compromising on them, by being uncompromising about, on our principles. That's how we're going to both achieve our vision for the future of the country, but unite this nation while we're at it. And I think that 
one of the things I'm most grateful for, even though it wasn't necessarily the standard Republican primary activities, was talking to not just the audiences who agree with us, but to talk to many of the audiences who didn't. And I think that's how we're going to save this country in our hour of need. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Vivek Ramaswamy Thank for you. joining us this morning. Thank you. Genevieve Wood is right back out here. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you.